Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac Address. My name is Sabra Lane. I am the president of the club. I'm also the presenter of the ABC radio program AM. Today's guest is Stuart Roberts, the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and also the Minister for Government Services. If you're following the conversation online, you'll find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club AUST. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Stuart Roberts. Well, good afternoon, and Sabra, thank you. Thank you for Westpac, and great to see Departmental Secretary for DSS, uh, Catherine Campbell, uh, our CEO, uh, Rebecca Skinner, and of course, Randall Bougeau, the head of the, the DTA. Ronald Reagan famously quipped that the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yet even in its humour, President Reagan's remarks resonate. However, what if those remarks weren't actually terrifying? What if they were true? What if government not only helped, but helped in a delightful manner? And this is the challenge, can I say, that we are looking to solve within Services Australia. In August last year, the Prime Minister stood in the Great Hall of Parliament and asked the nation's public service and many senior public servants here today to refocus their efforts on service. He said, as we gather here in the Great Hall, I want to remind you of a poignant feature of this house of democracy. This is one of the few parliament buildings in the world where you don't have to walk up steps to enter it. Our parliament isn't a parliament over the people or above them, but one that people, that Australians, can freely and easily approach. This is a defining metaphor for the vision of Services Australia a vision of how Australians should see their government, and of course, a vision of the establishment of Services Australia. So this afternoon, I'd like to take you through three uh, quick areas. One, what we've achieved together in the last 12 months. Two, the frankly, the baptism of fire for government service delivery over the last six months. And then thirdly, the government service delivery vision and next steps going forward. But firstly, the first 12 months of Services Australia. I think it's fair to say that historically there has been a stigma around government services. People associate government services with Centrelink queues or long wait times on the phone, and as a result, people have tended to cringe when they need to engage with their government. Unlike a bank, like Westpac or a business, when Australians face an unsatisfying government experience, they frankly aren't able to shop around for another government. They can't look for a different service provider. But, like Australians always do, they like to share their negative experiences of their interaction with government. Our vision is for people and businesses to access government services as easily as they can and with as little intervention as possible, just like as if you were going shopping or online banking or booking a holiday. Now, we all know having vision is a good start, but execution is all that matters. So 12 months ago, we commenced a major transformation of Services Australia to realise this vision. I've given a number of speeches outlining the intent and the plan for this transformation. And I'm pleased to report we are achieving some significant results at a rapid pace, results, frankly, that governments have been trying to achieve for well over 10 years. For example, for well over a decade, the Department of Human Services call blocked or, frankly, hung up on approximately 30 million social services and welfare calls every year. 30 million Australians. Following significant improvements in technology and work practices, today there is zero call blocking uh, on the social services and welfare line. That is more than 150,000 calls that were once blocked every single day for the last decade are now down to zero. And we're gonna keep it that way by continuing our work on simplifying and digitising services, but a bit more on that later. Over the last decade, people could wait well over 30 minutes for their call to be answered by Centrelink on that line. Right now, the average speed of answer is five minutes. In fact, the average speed of answer on that line on Friday was a minute and two seconds. 
Over the last decade, all claims were made by paper forms uh, and were manually processed. Today, all major claims are online and we've begun streamlining through automation and simplifying end-to-end -end processing of claims, starting with students most recently with job seekers. Over the last decade, digital channels could handle or could not handle more than about 55,000 concurrent users. Today, they've got a capacity for over 300,000 concurrent users, easily managing over 120,000 users we saw on average online six days ago on July 1. In the month of June this year alone, there were 60 million logons to MyGov and the Centrelink Online and app. 60 million Australians logging on. Over the last decade, creating the all-important customer reference number could only be done at a shop front when you turned up with a whole swag of documentation. Today, it can be created or retrieved securely online, and in the last eight weeks, over 300,000 Australians have done just that. Over the last decade, people had no choice but to go into a service centre, a Centrelink shop front, if you like, for most transactions. Today, there is no need to go to a shop front. The majority of transactions can be done online or over the phone. That's why, over the last decade, digital transactions were measured only in the millions. Today, they are measured in the many, many hundreds of millions. So it's been a big year of delivery, with substantial runs on the board, and Australians can have confidence in the direction we're heading. The next 12 months, though, promise to deliver even more. The last six months, though, have been quite the baptism of fire. And the Services Australia story, frankly, will be forever defined by the challenges it has faced uh, and the hard-working public servants have overcome over the last six months. At the outset of 2020, Australia was facing a natural disaster on a scale rarely seen, as bushfires, which started in August last year, raged across substantial parts of the country. The bushfires took loved ones. They damaged property. They wrought destruction on our, national ha on our natural habitat and they brought trauma to so many. Services Australia's role was crucial in providing the connective tissue between Australians and their government. Right across the country, Services Australia deployed mobile service teams and mobile service centres over 420 times into 200 communities where staff served more than 7,500 Australians. Ably assisted by the Australian Defence Force, our people supported in otherwise completely inaccessible locations many Australians, and they worked side by side with other state and federal agencies to deliver an all of government effort and response to people who had few other options. Services Australia provided disaster payments, temporary accommodation, and up to date information all in the one place. In fact, during the terrible bushfire season, we paid out more than $223 million in disaster recovery payments, took over 200,000 calls via our disaster payment hotline. The average speed of answer for those 200,000 calls was measured in seconds. And in most cases, those payments made to Australians were made in minutes using the new payment platform. Now, as drenching rains brought a reprieve from bushfires and indeed spoke for so many Australians, we all had to find another gear as COVID-19 gripped the globe and unfortunately continues to grip it. The nation's leaders made extraordinary decisions that resulted in unprecedented demands for government social supports, arguably not seen since the Great Depression. Indeed, the immediacy and the scale of the demand is possibly without precedent in the history of the Commonwealth. Now, we'd tasked Services Australia to prepare for this, and they did preparing office in a box, kits for thousands of our staff to work from home. Uh, many of those kits are now being used in Victoria. We massively upgraded our digital channels, upgraded our telephony work workforces and got our staff ready to respond to the needs of Australians. However, the pandemic was evolving so quickly that come the 22nd of March, National Cabinet uh, had to put Australia into a widespread lockdown. Well over a million Australians found themselves out of work overnight. Uh, and looked for immediate assistance from their government. We witnessed how Australians reached out in record numbers for support, queuing up at Centrelink and putting MyGov under a significant and sudden load which it had not seen before. We had to act quickly to manage this demand. An intent to claim process was quickly established to allow Australians to register their unemployment and secure the benefit 
uh, or the date of that benefit from the date they lodged their intent to claim. Over the next 27 days, 1.9 million intent to claim forms were lodged. JobKeeper was introduced to help keep people employed and connected to their employer. However, Services Australia would still process 1.3 million job seeker claims in 55 days, uh, a process and a claim volume normally processed in two and a half years. At the peak, more than 53,000 claims were completed by Services Australia in a single day. The team normally does 2,500 in a day. Government directed a wide-scale APS recruitment drive to redeploy resources from right across government to increase process or claims processing capability and, of course, to assist with answering a huge influx of phone calls. Picture a line uh, about one and a half metres apart, obviously, stretching out 22 kilometres. That's 14,800 additional short-term staff mobilised by government to accelerate the delivery of support to Australians including 2,000 redeployed Australian public servants from a wide range of government departments and agencies that help processing and answering forms. Government also ensured that more than 300 walk-in service centres around the country would stay open, whilst keeping customers and, critically, our staff safe. Now, luckily, local police very helpfully visited our sites to check that all was well a staggering 152 times, including one on horseback. Uh, and they noted in every single instance that social distancing measures were being correctly maintained despite the volume of customers. Simultaneously, we had to grapple with the nationwide shortage of most basic supplies needed, like hand sanitizer. So even as the calls flooded in, we had to ensure Services Australia would be ready to implement all of the policy changes that would be required as National Cabinet continually assessed the scale of the crisis and the necessary response. Over those 55 days, the agency would implement 50 substantial policy changes to 20 payments on behalf of numerous government departments. Tech teams worked every day, many of them 24-7. Service centres operated every day. Call centre hours were extended 8am to 8pm, seven days a week. The department would add almost 300 new services to the Medicare benefit schedule, often within hours of government making decisions. And the government, or wrong, the agency, also grasped, unfortunately, what many of us feared, that widespread lockdowns may indeed heighten the risk for those affected by family and domestic violence. That's why every person recruited to work on the call lines was given training in identifying and responding to the indicators that a caller may be experiencing domestic violence. So over those first 55 days, we run a channel operations facility. Imagine a big room full of lots of TV screens. Uh, a bit like the Stock Exchange or NASA's Mission Control. Uh, over those days, they monitored 3.7 million phone calls, 1.9 million service centre walk-ins, a quarter of a million Facebook messages and tweets. On our busiest day, single day during that time, MyGov recorded over 3 million users in that 24 hours, all successfully lodging claims or conducting other business with government. Now, what makes these figures even more remarkable of what the incredible public servants and services Australia did was that the new job seeker payment that people were applying for was literally hours old. You see, 18 months earlier, the then Department of Human Services had begun the process of consolidating seven different payments for working age people into one. And the date chosen to launch that was March the 20th. And indeed, the claim went live, and then two days later, on Sunday the 22nd of March, millions became unemployed and job seeker payment was called upon in enormous numbers. I think it's fair to say these are not the circumstances in which any of us would have chosen to introduce Australians to Services Australia and the new, and the new job seeker payment. But as we all know, rarely are we afforded actions on our own terms and our own time. The Digital Transformation Agency, also in my portfolio, found this out very quickly. As we grasped from very early on, we were not only facing a health and economic crisis, but an information crisis as well. The DTA was tasked to ensure all Australians could access up-to-date and reliable information on how the government is responding to the pandemic and what they, citizens, Australians, could do to protect themselves and their families. 
Within days of the response to the pandemic, we established australia.gov.au as a source of truth alongside the Coronavirus Australia information app to help Australians navigate the complex web of information about the virus, quickly followed up then by the introduction of a WhatsApp channel. Nearly 24 million visits to australia.gov.au to access the latest news and updates has occurred now available in over 60 different languages to ensure all Australians have the opportunity to get the correct information. In a matter of weeks, the DTA and the Department of Health then developed the COVID Safe app to assist and speed up our contract tracing efforts. The app has had some of the greatest take up of sovereign contact tracing apps anywhere in the world with over 6.5 million registrations. Now, I think it's fair to say that there are some detractors of the app but government believes we have got this one right. We had to balance security and privacy concerns with operational requirements. The app does and continues to have significant benefits in supplementing our health response to the pandemic, as evidenced by the recent peer-reviewed study conducted by the Sachs Institute and recently published in Public Health and Practice Journal. So it's not been an ordinary 12 months and frankly, it's been an extraordinary six months. Over this time in the government services part of the portfolio, my unrelenting focus has been to create Services Australia as an agency that thinks about its purpose, not as the business of administering payments, but of servicing Australians. As I say to my team, if service is beneath you, frankly, leadership is beyond you, and service is not beneath the team at Services Australia. Was it easy? No. It was bloody hard. Were there mistakes made? Plenty. But we only made them once, and when we failed, we failed very fast, and we tried again. And lastly, our service delivery vision and next steps. No matter how historic the last few months have been, or how much the Services Australian team and DTA have achieved, we remain very much focused on the next steps as part of our plan. We have a very large and ambitious vision anchored in addressing a very large question, what is it that Australians want? So we went out and asked them in enormous numbers. And they told us that getting help should be simple, that systems and people should be helpful, things should be intuitive, the service should be respectful of people's time and circumstances, and the process should be transparent. Simple, helpful, respectful and transparent. Sounds easy, extraordinarily complex to achieve. So let's unpack the next steps of the transformation plan for Services Australia. Uh, that is, how are we going to get there? So let's start with simple. Not that long ago, simple meant taking a cold clutch of receipts and turning up at Medicare in your lunch break. Now it means simply swiping your card at the doctor's office. In fact, you can now do everything you need to do with Medicare online. In the not too distant future, simple will mean Australians are able to access the information and the services they need in one place tailored to their individual circumstances, regardless of government structures or the level of government services comes from. Now, there's a lot of work to make things simple. To achieve this, we need to have systems that can interact with each other seamlessly and can assess the needs of the customer, not simply at a transactional level, but across multiple policy domains. To give an example, looking for work. It's very different for a vet student compared to a single parent, compared to a farmer who's lost everything in the drought, or compared to a person with disability. So in order to achieve this interaction across systems, in November I flagged that we'll be developing a whole of federal government architecture. This is well underway. It's mapping current capabilities against our needs going forward with the goal of identifying and investing in the strategic platforms and technologies that can scale across agencies to deliver services consistently and effectively. Buy, build, develop once, but use many times. I'll give you an example. Services Australia is now implementing its new entitlement calculation engine. Software is PEGA and the systems integrator is Infosys. The capability will replace the 30-year-old system that currently runs uh, on the IBM mainframe. This will mean welfare entitlements will be calculated much faster, more accurately 
and again enable government to more readily explore the effects of new policy before rolling them out. Given the tried and tested scalability of the platform, the government now will also be able to reuse this big technology platform, this entitlement calculation engine, in other areas that require similar functionality, starting with aged care and then expanding to other areas, such as veterans, and then the modernisation of our health systems. This will save taxpayers enormous amounts of money. It will increase the speed of implementation and remove friction from customers across government. And we are methodically and purposefully building these big architectural blocks that will sustain the future of the delivery of services to all Australians. We're currently leveraging our investment in major transformation projects to deliver reusable technology components that substantially reduce costs and complexity and speeds up delivery. Some of the more recent architectural blocks we've been building out as part of this architecture for all of government include a common set of API standards, application programming interfaces, how you connect with computing systems, uh, so that systems can talk to each other it's been agreed with all states and territories. So we're already rolling out APIs for providers to connect seamlessly within the National Disability Insurance Agency, also in my portfolio. We now have a national approach to digital identity across all states and territories to make supporting customers easier and consistent. We've already built a single payment utility uh, linked to the new payments platform that'll be reused right across government for making payments to customers. We now have the PEGA business rules, the entitlement calculation engine platform, that will calculate entitlements as they roll out across new capability in government. Government's also developing a new whole of government permissions and, and permits platform, which will le leverage uh, previous work in this key area and will deliver a modern permissions and permitting platform that will be used for visas and, and other areas of permitting across government. The project run by the DTA and reporting through to me is a key government priority as another one of these key architectural building blocks. We've also launched the beta of the enhanced MyGov. It's a modern platform capable of scaling up to include digital identity and to become a fully fledged all of government customer experience. One digital front door for all of government leveraging the new online capability already delivered for Centrelink customers through the Welfare Payments Infrastructure Program and again recently reused by the Veteran-Centric Reform Program. So the list goes on and on of core architectural building blocks for all of government. The whole of government enterprise resource planning, ERP program, a government private cloud, other platforms and technologies that will be scaled up across whole of government and potentially whole of nation as we work with our colleagues in the states and territories. Because delivering services that are simple to access and use does not stop at the boundary of one tier of government. The second area that citizens want, Australians want, is helpful. I regularly talk to my counterparts in state and territory governments and the desire to provide helpful and intuitive services that eliminates friction is universal across the board. Through the Australian Data and Digital Ministerial Council, which I chair, we've been meeting quarterly since June last year and monthly since April. We've been pursuing an unrelenting agenda of simplification and alignment right across the Commonwealth. So far, we've covered a fair bit of ground and achieved agreement on a wide range of areas. Going forward, we'll continue to share and align our initiatives to deliver services that are helpful for Australians and in the current economic climate to make far better use of taxpayers' money. A significant amount of money is spent, as you'd imagine, across all tiers of government on tech. I think we need to make better collective use of that money, as well as use government procurement as an effective tool for creating jobs and contributing to economic recovery in the period ahead. We currently have to seek hardware, software, integrators, consultants, providers, advisors in very separate approaches to market in order to get the end-to-end -end capabilities we need for a platform. It takes a lot of time, money and effort on all sides. Going forward, I want to see those providers come together and work collaboratively to see effective solutions that ensure better collaboration, very clear accountability for delivery and far better value for money. If we're going to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on platforms and tech, these platforms should be scalable 
and repeatable across government so we can achieve the vision of simple and helpful services. Now, the Commonwealth is well and truly prepared to play its role in this. We'll initiate procurement reforms that will enable the private sector to work collaboratively to deliver whole of government and potentially whole of nation platforms. At the same time, we must look at procurement for reforms that promote the role of Australian innovation and ensure that we prioritise Australian jobs and capability as an integral part of delivering strategic platforms. In a post-COVID world, we need to be able to help our fellow Australians not only through the services we deliver, but also ensuring we continue to stimulate jobs and encourage growth. A close cousin of simple and helpful is respectful. Respectful means respecting people's times as well as their goals in life. And respectful must be inclusive of everyone, including those who cannot take advantage of streamlined digital services through the One App experience. This means, for example, reimagining our telephony systems with a single whole of government voice biometric service and ensuring every caller's needs are met, whilst giving opportunity to access digital channels and assistance. We already have over 1.5 million voice biometric enrolments with over 3,600 new enrolments each day. In the 1920 financial year, which just finished, we saw over 3 million authenticated calls, which enables better service through personalised messaging, digital assistance and process automation. We also need to see a renewed shopfront experience, supporting self-service while increasing support for more complex cases. Why can't going to a service centre be a much more productive experience and be respectful of your time? We need to continue to simplify processes and integrate data and systems to make the experiences of customers at particular stages in their lives just work because services should fit around your life and your circumstances. They shouldn't fit around the silos of government organisations. We're already making some really good progress on this journey to achieve it, as demonstrated by the new MyGov beta site. The site is trialling ways to make it easier to find the information and services people need quickly and simply. We're bringing together multiple services across federal, state and territory governments in a single location to achieve the, just that. The current site is, has a focus on helping Australians navigate and recover from emergencies like coronavirus and recent bushfires. If English is not your first language, we've made it easier with over 110 languages available throughout the entire beta site. This is about getting the underlying foundation for the state-of-the-art government services and government's front door right for all Australians. If you go to Netflix or Facebook page, you can personalise it. There's no excuse why you shouldn't be able to personalise your dealing with government. We know Australians already expect MyGov to proactively serve relevant content and personalised experiences by anticipating and delivering services in a similar way to how people consume Netflix. Since we launched the site a few weeks ago, 45,000 people have visited. Customer feedback from the trial site will guide us on the areas to focus on the future of MyGov, such as authenticated services, bringing information together and high value transactions such as job seeker payments that Australians need. So I'd encourage you all to go and visit the new MyGov beta website. Just go to my.gov.au, scroll to the bottom, little tab there, future of MyGov, uh, and have a look and provide your feedback so we can ensure the future is providing the very best services for Australians. And finally, transparency. I mean transparency in everything we do. Transparency for the customer in how processes work, how long a claim will take, where your claim's up to, and clarity on all of those at any given point in time. Imagine a future which is not that far away of having a personalised dashboard so Australians can see their claims, their payments, if indeed they have a debt and how that debt was raised and other services and payments and assistance available to them. And on top of that, transparency in how their government agency is monitoring and addressing their concerns. And it's not about transparency for its own sake, though important. It's about sharing information that drives us towards our goals. When we de developed the COVID Safe app, Australians were loud and clear that they expected uh, their government to respect their privacy and have their data stored, secured and protected here in Australia. We have enacted legislation that achieves just that. 
we made a deliberate decision to publish the privacy impact statement and indeed the source code so everyone could see it. Now the tech community has worked with us and have now completed, or we've now completed, seven updates to the app, the last one a few days ago, uh, including addressing over 30 potential bugs and areas for improvement raised by the tech community at large. Consequently, the University of Adelaide has recently rated the Australian COVID Safe app the safest globally after comparing it to 34 similar apps. And my conversations with digital peer ministers around the world echo this sentiment. And going forward, we need to acknowledge community expectations and be transparent about how we manage the information that Australians are concerned with sharing with us. Accordingly, I can announce we're currently examining the sovereignty requirements that should apply to certain data sets held by government, in addition to the existing protective security policy framework. This will include considering whether certain data sets of concern to the public should be declared a sovereign data set and should only be hosted in Australia in an accredited Australian data centre across Australian networks and only accessed by the Australian government and our Australian service providers. We need to ensure that Australians can trust that government will appropriately manage the information they provide to us, whether it's from tracing apps or through to the census. Through the data availability and transparency legislation the government will seek to introduce in the period ahead, will ensure services are designed so we don't have to ask Australians to provide the same information time and time again. This will enable us to streamline the process of applying for a service, benefit, permission or a grant while providing visibility and transparency of that process. This transparency and trust will be critical as we pursue our goal to make all government services digitally available by 2025 and frankly enable our country to grow and prosper. So in conclusion, this is the future we are driving toward together. A future where government services are simple, helpful, respectful and transparent. A future where people can share data with government because they can see the benefits clearly for themselves as Australians and they can trust government to keep their data safe and secure. A future where Australian innovation is at the centre of the economic recovery and government worked with the private sector to deliver seamless services across the nation. A future, dare I say, where people may actually believe us when we say we're from the government and we're here to help. Thanks very much. Thank you, Minister, for the speech. On the principles, I'd like to pick up on that point uh, and say, you, you say that the future lies with the government being simple, helpful, respectful and transparent. The past is usually a pretty good indicator to future behaviour and many people watching this would probably think, well, on robo-debt, how did all of those principles of apply on being simple, helpful, respectful and transparent. You could equally ask over the last 10 years, hanging up on 30 million Australians or people waiting for 30 minutes on the phone, the last 12 months have demonstrated that we can solve all of those problems and putting down some key markers sets us up well for the future. One of the key things where we're going with Enhanced MyGov is to give people a personalised dashboard where they can see exactly how much uh, they've either paid in tax, what benefits they've got, what they're claiming for, what their payments are, if there's a debt, what the debt is, exactly how it was raised. So going forward, we're drawing some very strong lines in the sand to ensure that that transparency absolutely exists. But do, do you acknowledge that robo-debt and the way that was handled wasn't simple, wasn't helpful, wasn't respectful, and it certainly wasn't transparent? Well, certainly acknowledge that the use of average ATO data that's been going on for 20 or 30 years, many decades, that's now shown to be insufficient, uh, certainly was not helpful or respectful or transparent. Uh, but going forward, and this is where the, the transformation is so important, is that we've put down some solid markers. Uh, we're saying to the Australian people, this is how we're going to operate when it comes to your data digitally going forward, uh, and this is how we're going to be measured. Have you made it clear that you don't want another robo-debt style thing under your watch? Oh, I think the, uh, the nation's leaders have made it clear right across the country that, that no one wants to see uh, long-standing practices 
turn you, around and, and, be, and be shown to be unworkable and not wanted. Yeah, but you personally, because you're the minister with carriage of that. Ab oh, absolutely. We don't want to see any of, uh, of these areas of contention come up again. We actually want to demonstrate on the brand promise and actually be helpful and be transparent uh, and live out the brand promise we want to take to Australians. All right. First question from the floor is Sarah Ison. Sarah Ison from the West Australian, thank you for your speech. Just in terms of the next few months, is Services Australia preparing for an increase in people who are going to need unemployment supports and payments, as we know there's going to be some tapering off or expiry of payments post-September? Is that a directive you've been given? Is that something you're preparing for? Uh, absolutely preparing for it. So 1.6 million Australians are on payment. As JobKeeper starts to, to slowly come off, and the Treasurer, of course, will address all these issues in the coming weeks in his financial statement, we need to be prepared for more Australians to come on to payment. Now, if they don't come on, superb. But the nation can be assured that Services Australia will not be flat-footed on this. It'll have the capability, the people and the resourcing to deal uh, with any increase should it arrive. On JobKeeper, the, the tax office is the agency responsible for handling that payment. How well placed is your agency to be able to pick up that work in September should, um, you know, and again I'm not wanting you to give away secrets here, but should the government decide that the one size fits all payment is not appropriate and it should be tailored more to what a person is actually earning? Is your, the, the systems you've been talking about today, are they capable of being up to the task of delivering payments like that? Well, I'll leave the Treasurer to talk about the future and where it's going to land, but Services Australia is the largest IT shop in the Commonwealth. The big IT shops are Services Australia, Home Affairs, Defence uh, and the ATO. They, they are the big four in terms of where it sits. And if you look at our experience with, with MyGov, we can take 300,000 concurrent users. So the 1st of July, uh, the, the day before, so 29th of June was about 30,000 concurrent users on MyGov. Uh, the 30th of June saw that go up to about 90,000. Uh, and then the 1st of July, right through the day, literally from 8am to, to 6pm, uh, you had an average of, of 123,000, but speaking up to 140,000 concurrent users, uh, and the platform worked perfectly. So they are, uh, we've scaled our platforms to deal with huge numbers of users in anticipation of any change in government policy. Pablo Vignales. SBS News. Minister, thanks for your speech. You mentioned the historical stigma for people on welfare, and we're still seeing that evident today, particularly culturally and linguistically diverse communities. You just have to look at the comments that Pauline Hanson made just yesterday. What is the strategy to try and address this, particularly at a time where vulnerable communities are relying on these services more than ever? In the past, you had no choice but to go to Centrelink, where everything was in English. Uh, yet we know we're one of the most successful multicultural nations on earth. What we're now building out in terms of digital platforms and telephony platforms is massive alternatives to going to a shop front, where if you're someone from a cultural, linguistically diverse background or someone from a remote Indigenous community, you'll be able to go to what will replace MyGov, go to your uh, specific personalised part on that and see all your payments and your claims. You'll be able to do all of your claims online. You'll be able to see where everything's up to and you'll be able to do it in 110 languages. So the first step is to provide services and information and support to communities where they're at in their language. And that'll go a long way to addressing that. Because it's all about saying we respect your time, we respect your language, and we respect you may not be able to get out and about, but if you do, if you do go to a service centre, those service centres will be geared to do the more complex transactions and spend more time with you because we've got that much more capacity. Stephanie Dalzell. Hi, Minister. Steph Dalzell from ABC News. Hello, Steph. Hello, Minister. We had a lovely time last time here. We did, always. On the COVID Safe app, has it ever uncovered a contact trace that hasn't been verbally communicated by the patient? I don't think so yet. You need to actually ask the states and territories about this, but my understanding uh, from what I've seen is that it's been used well over 30 times uh, and, and it has picked up exactly what the manual tracing has got. One of the problems, one of the good things, but a problem all in the same, same breath, is we've had so few cases to date, notwithstanding some of the real challenges we're seeing down south, that we really haven't been able to see the app roll out in its full capability. 
Now remember the app's designed to enhance a manual tracing process. Uh, and if we get to the end where there is a vaccine uh, and all we've done is back up manual tracing and confirm, hallelujah for the country. That'll be a great thing. Just on the, the lockdowns that are happening in Victoria at the moment, so far nine blocks are in a hard lockdown, those towers around Melbourne. Um, I'd imagine that there'd be many people in those blocks who are NDIS recipients. Mm -hmm. How did your department get around the early provisions that the government in Victoria made? They, I mean, they said no one's allowed in. There's about 90 participants, to be precise. The agency has contacted them all. I spoke to Minister Donnellan yesterday, as soon as the Victorian government made that statement, to say, here are the participants. We provide all those details through to the Victorians. Uh, and I made it very clear to Minister Donnellan uh, and he's, can I say, he's a very good minister and working really well, uh, that we actually need to provide services through to those participants, uh, that it is unacceptable if they don't receive the services because there are services of attendant care, of support that are quite critical to people with disability, uh, and Victoria's given every assurances they'll be provided. Rosie Lewis. Minister Rosie Lewis from The Australian. Uh, Services Australia has said they'll start repaying the robo-debt in small amounts from now, with most to be repaid from the end of this month until the end of November. How much will someone receive in any one instalment? Because they've said there will be smaller amounts. And is it fair that we will still have people, presumably some of the 470,000 owed their, their debt refund still owed that in December. So 373,000 Australians. The average repayment will be about $1,900. That's the average. One of the reasons there'll be some instalments, and there'll be about 7,000, give or take, Australians will have it in instalments, only because there is a check in the system where the system can't pay out any more than $6,999 in one instance as a check and balance. It came about... I'm looking at Secretary Campbell over here. It came about... Many years ago, I think Kim Carr was the minister, where a, a human services participant, instead of wrong, a human services staff member, rather than, and the secretary can correct me if I'm wrong, rather than putting the amount to be paid, put in the, the date, uh, and $4 million was sent to an individual. And that was considered by the government of the day probably not the right thing. Uh, so the Labor government of the day put in a cheque at that 6999. So that's still there as a cheque and sum. Uh, so that's why there'll be about 7,000, give or take, that will be done in two instalments. And, and how many will come, do you expect, after November? We'll, we'll start paying on mass from the 13th of this month. The government's just not geared to do refunds. It doesn't have a system for it, so we've actually built out that system. About 190,000-ish, we have all their details, their current client, clients. So the other almost 200,000, 180,000-odd, uh, will reach out to say, hey, come into MyGov, update your bank details, and as soon as they're updated, we'll pay you. Uh, so we suspect it'll take through to November for all those Australians to update their details. If they all updated their details in one go, great. We could pay them progressively over a number of weeks. Our experience indicates that won't be the case, that Australians will take time and update their details progressively. Paul Carp. Paul Carp from Guardian Australia. Thanks very much for your speech, Minister. Um, will you put that transparency principle into practice today by telling us how many people had debts levied against them solely based on income averaging over what you've just said is 20 to 30 years, long before the 2015 reference date for the class action? Uh, and if you won't say how many people, will you at least uh, give a commitment to give them refunds? I'm cognizant of the issues before the court, so I'll, I'll guard my words somewhat carefully. We've, we've come out to say there's 373,000 people uh, since 2015 who had a debt solely or partially uh, raised because of the use of averaged income data from the ATO. We know it's been going on for, for 10, 20 or 30 years. The Ombudsman report made that clear. Uh, we know that it started probably as early as 2007 on some mass. As I said in Parliament, we've done a sample of, uh, of 500 in 2009 and 16.6% uh, or about 4,000 debts in 2009 were raised wholly or partially with average ATO data. We did the same thing in 2011 and 24.4% of those debts were raised either solely 
or pass you through averaged income data. So that's the, the only data sets we have at present in terms of, of where we sit, uh, which just goes to show, I guess, the, the, the long history of the use of averaged ATO data uh, that had been common practice uh, for many, many years. So you don't know how many people had unlawful debts before 2015, but will you commit to find out and to give them refunds? Well, again, I'm cognizant it's before the court, so I'll keep my remarks to that, but that gives you an idea of, of the data sets pre-2015. But is the department undertaking an exercise to find out how many people had unlawful debts before 2015? Well, the fact that we've sampled in two years, in 2009 and 2011, would indicate uh, some of the efforts we're going to to understand the scale and the length of how the use of averaged income data has been. Why are you able to commit to give refunds to the people that are plaintiffs in the class action, but not to all the people before 2015 that you, you've suggested might have had unlawful debts levied against them? Those from 2015, because computing systems were built to do the income average process, we actually know who every single one of those individuals are, uh, and the amount of debt that was raised uh, prior to that, there was no computing system that existed to do it. Thank you. Uh, Katina Curtis. Uh, Katina Curtis from AAP. Do you talk to a lot about the, the principles that you're working on and the, the first key one you said seemed to be to make things simple for people. Before everything went digital, you'd, you'd, if Centrelink wanted to communicate to you, they'd send you a letter. Now I get a text message and an email to tell me there's a letter from Centrelink. I have to go through five screens online. I did it this morning. I have to go through five screens online to get the letter and it's in a PDF and I can't read it on my phone, it has to be on a desktop computer. How is that simpler? Great question because that just leads straight into the enhanced MyGov in the future. You need to sit down and go to my.gov.au, go to the bottom and see the enhanced MyGov and you'll see exactly what the future is. Do it on your handheld because you'll see exactly how it's built for your handheld. Uh, and the future of MyGov will re-envisage how all letters are being done. The intent is to move away from sending letters, but use an inbox. So you can go straight to the, 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 the front door for government, the enhanced MyGov, straight to your inbox, and everything will be there. One of the reasons right now we actually send people an SMS and others is to say, hey, there's something in your MyGov inbox, please have a look, because people routinely don't go there. Why can't you just send an email? Uh, Why can't you send the information in an email that you used to send in a letter to someone's the, Facebook? The cyber risks by using email raise exponentially through the roof. So we, we won't send secure documents to you via email. We'll put it through a secure inbox, currently the MyGov inbox, but the enhanced MyGov where we're going will simplify it extraordinarily. You'll love it. If you're a Netflix fan, you're about to become the front door of Australian government fan. Just going back to earlier points that you made in your speech about the mistakes, are you prepared to list your mistakes and what you've learned? Oh, absolutely. For example, on the 22nd of March, we prepared uh, MyGov for, for 50,000 concurrent users and it blew out 100,000. Uh, should, we should have prepared it for 300,000. Should I have gone for a 600% increase not knowing what what National Cabinet would do. We'd increase it substantially. We should have increased it more. Obviously, it set off our distributed denial of service alarms, but we didn't check uh, and actually investigate before saying, hey, it's a, it's a denial of service attack. We investigate all of them now, uh, and we do. I get a report every day in terms of the cyber activity that's occurring weekly for us. Uh, so investigating is always wise. Uh, where we started with the, the, the COVID Safe app, uh, moving forward, it started in, in Home Affairs uh, and we quickly realised it's all about health. This is a health app, so it was taken out of Home Affairs. DTA did it uh, as a, a health app, driving, driving through health. Uh, there's a, a swag more in terms of where we sat. Uh, we rolled out office in a box in terms of our preparedness to, to have our staff work from home. I thought I might be faced with 20,000 staff from home and we prepared for that. Uh, we only end up with with, uh, with six or seven thousand. Did we over prepare? I don't know. It's sort of it's sort of difficult to know. You've, you've got to work through that. Uh, I think we were right in keeping all the service centre architecture open so Australians uh, could come through. Uh, 
on the 23rd of March when a million Australians were unemployed. By Wednesday, we had the intent to claim up and running. Maybe I should have had the intent to claim on Monday. But then again, it was sort of 10.30 at night that, that uh, National Cabinet made their decision. Uh, so we, once issues happen, we move very fast to resolve them and fix them within days. Hindsight's the exact of science, but where we did make errors, we acknowledged them and we fixed them very quickly. And on the cyber risks that you talk about, given all the developments that are happening now within your department and transformation and given the recent warnings that we've had from the Prime Minister about um, attacks that are happening from offshore, how confident are you about the resilience of the system here and that they are robust enough to withstand these, you know, cyber attacks? Very. Our cyber operations centre is probably one of the most effective anywhere, certainly in this country. It's an extraordinary capability we have to monitor and run it. The Prime Minister announced recently uh, and spoke of a sustained actor providing a cyber attack. Uh, suffice to say, our department wasn't impacted at all in terms of, of penetration, impact or slowing down the capacity for people to receive payments or make claims. Remember, where Medicare, we do 600 million transactions a year. That's just Medicare alone. Forget everything else we do. Our transactional flow is the big four banks put together. It's more than them. It's huge. $210 billion flowing out. Uh, and all of that without a cyber penetration or, or substantial assault that has taken the system down. Uh, now, that's, that's the history. We need to continue to do that level of delivery and that volume is the major bank of government going forward. And there's enormous investment in terms of our cyber operations centre uh, to ensure it is massively fit for purpose. But at present, it's pretty good and Australians can be very confident uh, that government is, is taking this extraordinarily seriously. Mm. Michael Keating. Michael Keating from Keating Media, Minister. Services Australia seconded many staff for their temporary task force, which is now finished and those staff have returned to their parent departments. What is your department doing to capitalise on the lessons learned, the skills developed and the broader connections developed across the APS so that this experience isn't wasted? It's a really good question because we took about 2,000 staff from every single government department agency and there's still many, many hundreds still working. Uh, and we trained them and, and, and gave them skills and, more importantly, gave them the opportunity to connect with Australians. Uh, and it was wonderful going and visiting and watching and the secretary and the CEO took the Governor-General uh, and Mrs Hurley around as well. And seeing Australians, for example, protective service workers, people from the Asbestos Safety Authority, other areas that didn't normally connect with Australians, to get on the phone and just hear some of the heart-wrenching stories of Australians and be able to process payments and provide hope. Uh, I think it's a, a really good opportunity. I think there's an opportunity for us to look at a few things, such as when we bring a graduate program, should everyone come and spend a few weeks with Services Australia? CEO would probably love it. But I, I think that actually might be good for them. Now, that's a, a question for the Public Service Commissioner and for the Minister assisting the Prime Minister of the Public Service. But I think that as an outcome in itself would be, would be really, really good for anyone coming into DFAT or immigration or somewhere else just to start by serving Australians. Because if service is beneath us, leadership is well and truly be honest. Nick Stewart. Thanks very much, Minister. Uh, MyGov is obviously a terrific way of communicating for individuals to communicate to, with the government and vice versa. That's what the future is going to be about. On the other hand, we've had the COVID Safe app which the um, uh, Australians have decided they do want to communicate with the government. They want to provide the government with their information. And you've had American technology companies saying, no, we're not going to allow the, the government to host on our servers, on, on our uh, actual phones. And instead, they're keeping the, uh, you at a remove, which is degrading the effectiveness of the app. At what stage, you, you hinted at the, uh, the potential for some future conflict, perhaps. Uh, just do you, are you finding that, that the um, uh, technology companies are not embracing this in the way that you want them to? Do you find any pushback from that? And if not, can you guarantee us that the next or the future COVID Safe app, next time we have a, a COVID, will actually be hosted 
on the machine, on the uh, the iPhones or whatever, the phones themselves, so that it won't drain the battery relentlessly, so that it will actually be use usable with other and communicate with other technologies, other telephones, regardless of with which particular brand you happen to own. Well, I gather you're referring to Google and Apple that run their exposure notification framework, which is their way of saying to government, hey, if you use our framework, data can be held and just go from phone to phone and bypass government completely. Now, that's Google and Apple's approach. And, of course, uh, they bump up the Bluetooth signal strength if you follow their way. Uh, Australia, many other nations of the world, India, Singapore... Norway, Cyprus, Israel, France, uh, Great Britain, uh, the first digital movers of the world decided to actually take a sovereign view of COVID tracing in their app and connect it through to their public health officials. So our app, of course, works if uh, you're, it's polling every minute and collecting data, and if you test positive, a public health official will say, upload it to the secure data centre, and then public health will work with you. Google and Apple's exposure notification framework only polls, I think, every five minutes. I, I could be wrong, but I'm not far off. Randall's nodding at me. Uh, and plus, us as a sovereign nation will determine when the, the, uh, the pandemic is over. I'm not going to wait for Google and Apple to turn off their exposure notification framework with a new update to iOS. Uh, so I think there are some real sovereignty issues with allowing Google and Apple to dictate terms and how to do COVID tracing. I think we, the, the the first 10 nations to move on this and determine how we connected this through to our public health officials, uh, I think that needs to be respected. Uh, and I don't agree with Google and Apple that they should have a stronger Bluetooth signal if you use their system, but if you use the existing extant tech in the phone itself, you have a, uh, not substantial, but a slightly weaker signal. I think Google and Apple are wrong on that approach. I think they need to recognise and support sovereign nations to make sovereign decisions. Now, I understand we're using a ubiquitous device called a phone because everyone's got it as a way of doing things. But there's an opportunity, I think, here for the big tech companies to lockstep in with sovereign governments and assist them with their sovereign approach to doing tracing. Remember, digital tracing simply enhances a manual tracing process. The big tech companies with their exposure notification framework are saying that digital tracing unto itself is enough. The global experience shows quite clearly it is not enough. Digital tracing must enhance and manual tracing. That's how our approach has been. So will you tell them they've got to get on board? Well, we don't lecture corporations and companies through the media, but suffice to say from my remarks uh, that this is top of mind. You mentioned in your speech about the use of voice biometric um, service within government at the moment uh, and that people, one and a half million voice biometric enrolments are happening at the moment. Can you tell us, um, are you also doing um, trialling sort of facial biometric work in designing new government services? Absolutely. So MyGovID, which is currently available, it's been used by mm. 1.4 million Australians now across a staggering 70 services across the, the, the Commonwealth. Uh, our intent uh, by the end of the year, is to step that up a notch into a facial biometric or facial authentication services. So it'll authenticate against uh, a driver's licence and the uh, the uh, passport office, where we already have uh, your photograph per se, and that'll allow you to securely connect and authenticate through to a service. Uh, so you won't need to worry about forgetting a credential, changing a phone number or anything else. You'll simply use the native biometric on, on a phone or, or a computing device uh, and then authenticate through your phone that way and then you'll get the highest level of services. And then you won't have to fear about any of your credentials being stolen from yourself, from your own phone, from your computer and appearing on the dark web because it's very difficult to steal your face. Isn't it, Tim? A face we well recognise and love. And Tim Shaw is our last questioner. Thank you, Sabra, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Tim Shaw, National Director, a Director of the National Press Club of Australia. What I think you've described today is, is my gov is actually becoming my life from an Australian perspective, from every Australian's perspective. Um, what kind of timeline are you looking that the engagement with Australians, including more than just the ATO, COVID safe, um, Medicare, do you see your services from a digital trans? Information perspective, 
becoming all-encompassing and no Australian will go untouched from that opportunity to engage with government on their terms. Government's agenda is that all services available digitally by 2025, so that's your hard right shoulder. Uh, you've got the first look at MyGov, my life, this is your life, Tim. Uh, you got the first look at it, we'll progressively build it out with authentication services, so MyGov ID in a biometrically authenticated manner, uh, September-ish this year, but by the end of the year, including getting major payments up. Uh, I'd like to get this up and running, not just as a beta, but as a fully fledged site by the, the end of next year. So we want to move very, very quickly so that Australians can actually have that simple, personalised, transparent service. And then for those Australians who don't want to operate digitally, and we know only about 83% of Australians actually have a, a handset, so there's 17% of Australians that, that don't use that, mm. will still have very strong telephony as well as shop fronts for people to go into. So it'll be a full service offering. We're not abandoning shop fronts in any way, shape or form. But as many people as possible that can easily, simply, helpfully, transparently access services digitally, that will free up space on telephony channels and face-to-face -face for Australians with more complex needs, linguistically diverse needs, culturally diverse or remotely diverse. But the future is almost upon us. So go on to the MyGov beta, Tim. Make some comments. Let us know what you think. Shall we? Thank you. Excellent. With that, everybody please join me in thanking Thanks, Mr Arthur. Stuart Roberts. Thanks.